This is Create the Next from Pro CFO Partners, where every week we explore strategies and ideas for financial management and growth to help today's businesses put their financial picture in context. Welcome back to Create the Next. I'm Chris Bintliff, and I have with me again today the return of Tony Spina from Pro CFO Partners. And Tony, welcome back to the show. And I was thinking um, as we kind of start 2022, and there's been so much activity uh, the last 24, 18 months, uh, all over uh, with supply chains, all over with the uh, labor market, with the workforce. When you're looking at manufacturing, kind of as an industry, um, what are you seeing out there, first of all, just kind of the general sort of mood? Uh, how's it going? What are people concerned about? What's what's keeping people back? But specifically thinking outside of current events, uh, if I'm trying to grow my manufacturing company, what are some of the things that typically hold me back from doing that? So what are you seeing out there and what's holding me back generally <laughs> from growth? Well, first off, Chris, uh, I'm glad to be back and thank you for having me. Uh, well, well, I mean, obviously, the landscape over the last couple of years changed things, not only in manufacturing industry and in plenty of other industries. That said, the one difference with manufacturing is, unlike you, you know, we've all become accustomed to in the workforce with people working remote. I mean, manufacturing, the, you know, the guys on the floor still got to be there. You know? Yeah. you know, you can't do a lot of things remote in manufacturing. And I've always found that, you know, manufacturing people, generally like to be there anyway. It's a different mentality. It's even for the management staff, get there early, start the day early, get on the floor. They like to, you know, to touch and see and feel what they do. It's a big part of especially smaller manufacturing companies, if you will, uh, from my experience. That said, I mean, growing a manufacturing company, I don't think has changed all that much. I mean, during the last, you know, 18 months or so, you know, in, with COVID and stuff, you know, companies pivoted and found other ways to, you know, to generate or satisfy the revenue, you know, revenue that they need to survive. And the, the company, there were a lot of companies who were very successful at that, um, entering new uh, industries and markets to, if you, I hate to use the word, but capitalize on COVID, but in some ways service like you know, a new industry, uh, you know, that COVID created. For instance, I had one printing company that, you know, they never really did anything for schools and, you know, hospitals are very not, mu- not much, but, you know, with all the signage that came out with, um, you know, social yeah. distancing and, you know, there were opportunities there. So they were able to pivot, you know, use some of their machinery and equipment, you know, to help fill some of that demand that it replaced you know, 100% the revenue that was lost through the traditional channels, probably not, but they were still able to to pivot and resulting, you know, they've actually, uh, this one particular company actually was able to keep many customers in some capacity as a result of what they did during COVID. Interesting. Do you you think that this, um, a lot of smart companies, I think, um, and I don't think there's a difference between exploiting circumstances and uh, responding to market dynamics. And that's what all of a sudden happened, but can that mentality continue? So I think a lot of companies were sort of forced into innovation that might've been unusual or uncomfortable for them, but maybe now they've realized, you know what, maybe we should be paying attention to other opportunities or signals that we could be flipping. Is that, uh, do you think we can expect this to continue or once we sort of return to normal, uh, thank God that's over. Let's go back to making the widgets that we're used to. Well, I think it's really the, you know, people are all different, right? I think in, you know, in some manufacturing companies, it's, that was like a learn new skill and people, you know, became comfortable with it and are happy to continue along those paths. And then, you know, another, you know, manufacturing companies, maybe not so much, maybe the comfort level isn't there. But just to go back to, you know, what I was really wanted to expound on was like, you know, growing a manufacturing company is not that different today than it would have been a couple of years ago. I mean, I mean, for instance, one of the biggest difficulties, I think, especially for a smaller manufacturing company is time. I mean, in a smaller manufacturing company, you often have you know, management is kind of involved in everything, HR, finance, engineering, you name it. So they don't really have the time to work 
um, you know, on the business, if you will, they're working in the business, you know, and working on the business, that's where you can sit back and think, you know, and strategize or how am I, how am I going to grow this thing? Um, and, you know, time is, you know, difficult for some of these smaller uh, manufacturing companies for the management thereof. So the first thing that place to start is to actually find the time. And there may be a cost involved to finding the time, mm. whether if it's, you know, if it's the finance function, for instance, that's eating up too much of management management's time, you know, which takes away from, you know, time they can invest in looking at growth initiatives or, you know, or plan for growth. And, you know, maybe it's time to, you know, outsource, you know, that or bring in a new employee. Even. And then that could span, you know, HR too, which also as manufacturing companies grow, HR can be a huge time drain, I found. And most people don't actually love HR. <laughs> you need, <and> you're, <laughs> from my experience, t- talking, take it from somebody who actually was the de facto HR head of an organization for a number of years and, you know, not having been trained in it. And it grows in complexity as the company grows and you have more people. Well, that's, so, and that's just like a couple examples. That's a uh, great point. And I think there's a lot of functions that grow in complexity as the company grows, but we, uh, founders and executives and owners can, you know, as you pointed out, we've got our hands in everything and this unwillingness or incapability of letting go really gets in the way. And I think you really hit on something there where time becomes our currency and we're not going to manufacture more time. So mm-hmm. if we just keep adding more stuff that we feel like we need to have our hands in uh, something's got to give. And, and ultimately what I hear you saying is the vision of the company, uh, starts to be diluted or, 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 uh, compromised because that's the role. That's the essential role of that leader, um, that shouldn't maybe be tinkering with HR or with finance functions. What's, why can't I make that switch? Am I afraid to spend the money? Am I afraid to let go? Am I, do I have too much sort of personal kind of feelings about what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. I'm in a manufacturing company. I deal with so many vendors Mm -hmm. and supply chain and utilities. Why, why are these things so hard for me to let go of? I think a lot of it, I mean, once again, you know, it speaks to the individual and, you know, we're all a collection of individuals, right? But from what I've noticed, it's just kind of like a habit. You know, they're used to doing this. They're used to being, you know, closing the books or they're used to dealing with the guy in the line who's got, you know, an HR issue. And they, they've just never really known any other way. And they know, I think, intrinsically that, you know, it's not the right way if they want to grow. Um, and it's often, you know, like, you know, taking, you know, a present away from a child or something. I don't know. It's just like, you know, you don't want to part with something that, you know, you're, you know, you're used to, you know, being involved in, and in, in, in all honesty, in, in some cases it's fear-based too. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a comfort level in doing the same thing over and over and knowing what you're doing. And, you know, it can, can be challenging for, you know, for a manufacturer, you know, especially a smaller manufacturing company to really sit down and say, well, okay, how am I going to think about growth? And there's only so many ways you can grow, right? I mean, how many different ways can you grow? You can sell, you know, more of your existing, of your current products, if you will, to, you know, to the existing market and new mar- or new markets, or you can offer new products to existing and new markets, or you can look at business acquisitions, which to a smaller manufacturer, um, you know, they just, you know, immediately dismiss and, you know, and often they shouldn't because of, you know, one thing I like to point out is a business acquisition doesn't mean you have to acquire a whole, you know, a whole company. You can buy, you know, you can, a lot of times you can, you know, purchase like, you know, a product line, if you will, mm. from a company, you know, which will give you, you know, some element of growth, get you into something new, you know, at a, you know, much lower cost than obviously buying the whole kit and kaboobble, right? Um, you know, and those are the basic ways, I mean, that a company grows, right? And I also want to point out, you you know, people think growth, they think the top line, right? Revenue. Yes. And that's obviously growth. But, you know, you want to grow, you know, you want to grow profitably, right? You want to grow the top line revenue. You want to grow the bottom line um, profits. And ultimately, you want to grow cash, <laughs> you know? And, you know, you can grow to the top line and grow to bottom line, but you may find, you know, in a period of growth that, you know, your cash position is not growing, it's even decreasing 
because there's a cost to growth, right? I mean, if you're, you know, if you're doubling the size of your manufacturing business, what does that mean? That means that, you know, you need to usually generally means you need to carry more inventory, right? So you're investing the profits, you know, the growth back into the business, into working capital. And that can go for people too. As you grow, maybe you're only running, you know, one shift for all these years or a shift in that and a half. And I say, well, geez, I not my demand is too great now. So I got to run a full second shift or even a third shift. You know, all those, you know, add, you know, costs. So you, the idea is to grow profitably, um, um, ultimately, and it eventually turn to cash. But when you're making that first leap to another level, often the profits that you generate will be reinvested back into the business. And you won't see the result in cash, if you will, you know, at that point, uh, as soon as you'd like. When does it make sense for me to seek some sort of financing to help me with that versus, you know, just trying to make more cash so I can spend more cash? <laughs> well, I mean, for Remen, you know, there's multiple ways you can finance, right? I like to say, you know, you know, you want short term financing for a short term asset. So if it's an inventory receivables issue, you know, you you want to look at maybe you know, a line of credit. So you borrow what you need, you pay back. There's no um, fixed repayment schedule. You pay back and draw as you need and just pay interest as you go along. And under a traditional line of credit, it's usually a function of, um, you know, a larger line anyway. It's usually a function of receivables and inventory where the, the lender, the, the banks will lend you some percentage, typically 80% of receivables and, you know, 50% of inventory is common. And that, that should, um, you know, help your short-term cash needs and help you build, you know, the inventory and, and the receivables up, you know, comfortably without incurring debt. Now, if you're looking at, you know, growth through acquisition or a new product line, we, you know, we all know manufacturing is capital intensive, right? And it's almost, incumbent on a manufacturing company, despite the cost, you know, to stay current with technology, unfortunately, because the cost of not staying current with technology is, it could be great, right? If you're running, you know, you know, a certain product line in an old uh, 68 Ford or something, uh, to use the analogy, you know, and you're banging out, you know, 10 parts an hour, and now it's commonplace with new machine technologies to bang out 100 pieces an hour, you know, your competitors, you know, are going to beat you every time on cost and eventually you're going to lose whatever market share you have. So you're kind of almost like forced to say reasonably competitive, you know, with uh, with machinery and equipment and technology. So those are longer term assets. So, I mean, generally you want to finance a longer term asset with a longer term financing, whether, you know, it's equipment lines, which are, you know, a lot of banks are happy to um, to grant because the you know, the loan is backed by the actual you know, piece of equipment uh, that works well for a lot of manufacturing companies. If you're looking at, you know, acquisitions and something a little more sophisticated um, as far as, you know, a growth avenue goes, then you're probably looking at, you know, things like term loans. Um, and there's a cost, in, you know, there's a cost in time and the bank's going to ask you for everything under a term loan. There's a lot of... <laughs> You know, if you, it's probably something that smaller manufacturers probably couldn't handle on their own. And that's why we're going back to the point where some, you know, the smaller manufacturing company that was our owner or management team that's handling the finance function. Now they got to deal with a lender. Yeah. You know, a lot of times that's way beyond their capabilities. I mean, because, you mean know, to qualify for a term loan and get what you want, there's a lot of wealth of information. That goes into that, uh, that, that needs to be supplied. Otherwise, you're never going to get it. You so know, things me, like that may force the owner away from, or, or the management team, if you will, divesting themselves of certain you know, things they've always done. Yeah. And for me, this brings the whole conversation full circle, which is if I'm sitting there and my executive team or myself or my small group of you know advisors and we're trying to figure out growth strategies, you just dropped a pile of knowledge that maybe we hadn't thought about or maybe we hadn't explored or maybe we hadn't put the mindset behind financing the way that you just did. I mean, it's almost like you just sat in the room with us and said, well, have you thought about this and have you thought about that? Which gets to your point, it might be time to look for some people who can not just... Um, help you do the things, but help you think about the things. What do you think my role should be 
what should my CFO's role be in this? And what if I don't have a CFO? Um, what if I've got a bookkeeper or something? But uh, you're you're dropping a lot of strategy, and I I feel like some of us are missing out on that strategic component because we're limiting our mindset about that. What should I be doing differently there? Yeah, well, I mean, a growth plan is you know I you know. I don't know how to say it. A growth plan is part of a strategic plan, right? A growth strategy is part is a strategic initiative, right? Yep. Um, and not everybody in your organization may have, you know, the skill sets necessary to, you know, to work or, you know, on a growth strategy or a growth initiative, if you will. I mean, whether it relates to the financing piece of it or whether it relates to, you know, what should we make or what market should we be entering? I mean, and like I said, ideally, it should be part of, you know, a strategic plan. And a strategic plan scares a lot of people, Chris. I mean, if people think, oh, I got to spend, you know, hours just creating paper and this volume of, you know, this volume that's going to sit on my, my bookshelf. No, it doesn't. It, one or two pages works for most, for most, you know, you know, especially smaller companies, you know. And it gets what's good about it for if companies never gone through the exercise. It really gets you thinking, you know, and it leads, once you start thinking about the things you you know, should be thinking about and combined with the knowledge that, you know, that, you, that uh, owners and management often have of their industry, of their business, you know, it just gains traction and, you know, ideas start just, you know, coming out of anywhere, yeah. you know, you know, and it's a team collective, it's a think tank, right? I mean, and once, you know, Everybody, once the thoughts are out there and they're outlined, they're saying, and people are going to start agreeing, yes, let's do this. Let's, we can do this now. We can do this later. Uh, you know, I think it just evolved. I've seen it just evolve naturally. Um, but like anything else, you have to plan for growth as well, not only from that point of it, but, you know, cash is also often an issue. You know, I can't stress enough. I know in a previous session, I talk a lot about cash, so I'm not going to do it here, but, you know, you need companies need to plan for growth. If, you know, you got to need to know, you have to have both short-term and long-term cash flow uh, forecast to see if you have enough money to fund your initiatives. And if not, that we, 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 you know, then we have to look at financing them like we just discussed or, or what will be the pain points? Well, maybe we have enough to do this, this, and this for six months, everything being equal, but, you know, we're going to hit, when we get to here, you know, we're not going to have enough cash to, you know, to fund our initiatives. Uh, so it just gives you some, you know, a roadmap, if you will, or a vision, or I don't know, vision is the right word, but, you know, by just doing that and seeing where you think the pain points are, you know, will help you address them before you actually have to experience them, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Such good advice, Tony. Tony Spina is a CFO, Pro CFO Partners. And honestly, if you're a manufacturing company and anything that you just heard was something you hadn't thought of before, Give us a call. Uh, Tony is Tony is the guy. He can he can he can help you go from here to there. And uh, Tony, don't don't wait so long to come back again. It was a really great conversation, and I, I really uh, right. I'm so grateful right. for your perspective today. All right, thank you very much, Chris. Thanks, Tony. Have a good one. You too. Bye bye. Thanks for watching, and a special thanks to our subscribers. Consider becoming one today. Visit ProCFOPartners.com for more strategies and ideas for financial management and growth to help you put your business's financial picture in context.